great place to retire. I think Ashland has probably the friendliest people in California and Oregon combined. What most people don't remember is that the original name of Ashland was actually Ashland Mills. And the first business in town was a sawmill. Uh, run by Abel Hellman, at the head of what we now think of as, as Lithium Park. Abel Hellman is considered the, the founder of the town. Um, he came here in 1852 with Eber Emery, who was a friend of his. And they had been gold miners and uh, wannabe gold. And, and going to the gold mines in California, they'd gone through the Rogue Valley and really loved it. And um, they came back up um, when gold was found in Jacksonville. And um, they decided to add, they would make more money supplying the gold miners with lumber and goods than actually mining for gold themselves. And that, that's what worked out. This is the oldest picture of Ashland's Plaza known to exist taken in the early 1860s. Identifiable is Ashland House on the right, and behind it is Hardy Nine's 1859 store near the present site of City Hall. Abel Hellman started a primitive business district here when he made land available for shops and stores in front of his mill. The first settlers who came to Ashland, it was interesting, a number of them came from Ashland, Ohio, and the other ones came from Ashland, Kentucky. So there was no question about the name of the town. It was always going to be Ashland. But they were debating whether it be, would be named for Ashland, Ohio, or Ashland, Kentucky. So Abel Hellman, who again, founder of the town, um, had everyone draw straws for the name. And he actually got the, the short straw, so he got to choose the name. And so it is named for Ashland, Ohio, because that's where Abel Hellman came from. Ashland, Ohio was named for Henry Clay's estate in Lexington, Kentucky. And so all of the Ashlands in the country, and there are at least 26 of them, are all named because of Henry Clay's estate, which was called Ashland. Ashland was off to a great start, but in 1858, a shadow fell over the young town that threatened its stability for generations to come. Despite this being one of Ashland's darkest times, I have to honestly say this is probably my favorite story about the young town. Now, it would appear that in 1854, a young man by the name of David Sisson moved to the town uh, from the East Coast. He was very wealthy, he had a lot of power, and he intimidated the folks here and soon incurred a lot of enemies. Now, in 1857, he was leaving his house to grab a pail of water, and he was shot at and wounded. It wasn't lethal, it was just a flesh wound, to quote Monty Python, and uh, he really thought nothing of it at the time. It was still the early days of pioneering the Wild West, and that kind of thing happened, so he thought nothing of it. Uh, except the next week, his barn was burnt down, and he continued to be not suspicious, God knows why, and uh, the next week he was out in town, out in the plaza, and he was shot and killed in broad daylight, and people saw it. And at the time, at the time of his murder, he was, uh, he had a young daughter by the name of Augusta Sisson. She was one year old at the time, and 20 years later, she became curious as to why, her, who killed her father and she took it to court with the assistance of her fiancé, who was a lawyer, and it was thrown out because it was 20 years old. And it's really fascinating that nobody knows to this day who did it, but she had suspicion that it was Abel Hellman, the founder of Ashland. And uh, it's curious because in his barn were all of the papers of the land that he owned, and it's, it's been rumored that the land that is now the plaza belonged to David Sisson. And, uh, okay, you know, I just can't, I can't keep it back anymore. I went down to the Chamber of Commerce 
uh, to ask if they had any footage I could use in my documentary. And they said that they just found some, some breaking new footage that had been sealed away and they hadn't found it. And um, it's a, a short, short film about David Sisson that was from, from right after he was murdered. And uh, you're, yeah, you get to be the first people to see it. No one else has seen this. So um, please, enjoy it. I, th I think you'll like it. Um, play, play the clip. Play the clip. Oh yeah, I'm the one with the clip, aren't I? This event cast a dark time on the town, but even back then Ashland was a resilient place, and the citizens soon returned to their daily life. In 1879, the existence of one college and normal school was listed in the utility company's report on Ashland. With a mere 130 students, the term college was a bit of a stretch, and state funding was uncertain. If you look at some of the signage around the Southern Oregon State SRU, you'll notice that it says something to the effect of, I don't have the dates exactly right, but it's like 1890 to 1924 and 1929 to the present. The Southern Oregon Normal School was originally founded at another location further uh, out of town at the corner of what is now Normal Street. When the state of Oregon had budget troubles in the 20s, they shut some of the outlying schools down and kept OSU and U of O, and the Normal School was one of them, and the school closed. Um, and Ashland worked diligently to get the state to reauthorize funding for a new normal school. And what we think of as the Southern Oregon campus is the new normal school. And its original name was still the Southern Oregon Normal School. Slow, steady growth characterized Ashland until the winter of 1887, when Southern Pacific's North-South line was joined. A celebratory golden spike marked the spot at the south end of the town's recently built rail yard. It was now possible to travel in an elongated circle of tracks around the entire United States. With Ashland strategically placed closest to the steep Siskiyou Pass, soon a depot, roadhouse, water tank, repair shop, and stockyard were in place. The railroad really made Ashland. Um, I don't think people realize now how isolated Ashland was before. The town stayed really small because it was pretty isolated. Um, the Siskiyou Mountains just made it very difficult for people to get in and out of the valley. And the population was under a thousand up until 1884 when the first railroads came into town. One magazine said it was easier to get to Ashland by boat than it was to get by stagecoach. And the railroads instantly changed that. So Ashland was instantly connected. And not only that, um, with the railroad coming here, we were the division point for um, the Southern Pacific Shasta Line. So there were a vast number of railroad employees um, that moved into Ashland. And that became a big business in Ashland. So the town doubled in population within a couple of years. That continued until about 1927 with a natron cutoff. And um, one of the new um, managers of, who was the Union Pacific, 
um, decided that it would be cheaper to route trains not through the Siskiyou Mountains and Ashland, but through Klamath Falls. And so they rerouted the main passenger rails and freight through Klamath Falls and, and just skipped Ashland entirely. And it devastated the railroad community in Ashland. The last passenger train in Ashland came in 1955, August 6, 1955.